Don't you just hate it when you download a supposedly seamless image texture, but then when you go to your 3D software to tile it, it still looks very noticeably tiled? Well, the problem is likely not to do with the texture itself, but with the way you're using it. So in this video, I will show you four simple techniques for solving texture tiling forever. These techniques can be used independently or all together whenever you need. Um, and the end result is that you should be able to take a one by one meter grass texture and then tile it across a massive 20 kilometers of landscape without any noticeable tiling. So let's begin. You should definitely always start with a seamless image texture because for reference, here is this same texture, which is one from Polygon, uh, taken straight out of the camera with no cleanup. This is just raw and you can see that it looks far, far worse and the tiling is far, far noticeable. A seamless texture by comparison corrects for uh, light levels, it fixes hard seams and removes any noticeable irregularities like cigarette butts and things like that. However, if you tile anything 10 plus times, your eye will always notice distinct repeating patterns and shapes throughout it. And there are very few surfaces in the real world other than maybe like fine sand, which is like totally uniform and you won't find those repeating patterns. Everything else though, especially grounds, will always have some distinction which you want to keep because the real world has irregularities which you want to keep in there. Now, one solution that a lot of people think would work um, is to capture a larger surface. So instead of capturing say a one by one meter grass texture, you would instead capture a field of grass, right? Right? Um, well, we've done that on Polygon. This is a 40 by 40 meter uh, grass field texture, essentially. But this usually doesn't solve the problem because, of course, in order to see any of that detail, you, of course, need a larger image texture. So instead of a 1K texture, you would need an 8K texture. And even then, it's still blurry. And the problem with an increased image texture is that your texture memory usage, the memory usage, which goes to the graphics card in order to render it, um, skyrockets astronomically. If you go from a 1K texture to an 8K texture, you're usually using 53 times the amount of memory, um, which if you're building a large scene, which I'm guessing you are, if you need a large texture, um, you've just eaten up a huge chunk of your memory usage uh, for just one material. So that usually isn't applicable either and also you can't really get the camera in very close anyway um, so that's not really the best solution what is is understanding the correct way to use your texture which is what I'm going to show you right now so starting with technique number one which is tile rotation one of the big reasons why this looks so noticeably tile is because it's laying our texture in a grid fashion side by side and those patterns are obvious if each of those tiles were to be rotated independently at random amounts, uh, that would fix that problem for us. Unfortunately, almost no 3D software, as far as I know, um, gives you this tool out of the box, Blender included. So you would need to know a bunch of vector math in order to figure that out, which is why nobody does it. However, if you're a Blender user, then lucky you because I've done the hard work for you. Link is in the description for a blend file. If you go to file, append, click on the blend file, then go to node tree, and then just import in these three node groups. We're only gonna use one now, but we'll use the other two later on. So once you've done that, if you go shift A, group, Polygon Uber Mapping Node. Click that and drag that in. By the way, side note, if you are using our Polygon uh, Material Converter, these add-ons come included with that so you won't need this separate blend file. But for those others of you, just download the blend file, this is how you do it. So this blend, sorry, this node group here is designed to be used in replacement of this mapping node. So if we delete that and then drag this in here, connect the blue to the blue to the blue. Okay, now this one single scale value here replaces those three scale values that you typically have. Um, so you can see that if we set this to 10, which is what it was before, nothing has changed. It's exactly the same as the default mapping. Now, if you go down to the bottom here, there's one called mosaic rotation. And this is where the magic happens. As we increase this, watch what happens. 
Ta-da. <laughs> it's remarkable how effective it is. It's, uh, it hasn't really done anything other than, if you look at grid view, this is what it is, you know, side by side, standard grid formation. Mosaic rotation is just taking each of those tiles and it's rotating it independently. And it's, uh, it's amazing how it just makes those patterns far less noticeable uh, to your eye. Now, something to note is that uh, if you look uh, you'll see that you're actually introducing some hard seams there that weren't there previously because um, that seamless texture is obviously only designed to be used in a grid fashion, of course. You, it Independently rotating each one is now going to introduce seams. But amazingly, it's actually far less noticeable. You can see it in some places like right here, but it's still far less noticeable than it is normally. Um, now, if you do see a hard seam that you don't like, uh, we've got a mosaic noise uh, value as well, which if you increase that, that. What that's done now is, uh, if you look in grid view, instead of it being hard lines, it's now just created uh, squiggly lines, which just makes it a little bit harder for your eye to detect um, a hard seam. Um, but just that alone is really, really powerful. And you can see like as you increase the scale here, like you can go to like a really high value of like, let's go 40 by 40 meters. Um, and you can see that that's, that's pretty good. Now it is a little boring, but at least your eye is not immediately noticing a uh, repeating pattern. Um, and by the way, limitation of this method, obviously it's not gonna work for like brick, tile, and other fixed patterns like this. Um, however, the next three techniques will, so use them for that. Speaking of which, number two is color variation. Um, essentially in the real world, every single surface has slight variations to the hue, saturation and value of a color. So like a grass field will have little brown patches, um, etc. And it's so easy to do in 3D software. It adds so much to the realism and breaks up surfaces. There's no excuse for not doing it. So I'll give you a node which does it all in one step, but I think it's helpful to understand what goes into the node. So the basics of it is this. Um, if you've ever played with a hue saturation node, right, you will know that uh, this essentially changes like the hue of something, right? And you can make it like look a little bit brown or like desaturated, etc. cetera. Um, but if you then took a noise texture or any texture and then just plugged that into the factor input, now this noise texture is acting as a mask for this. So um, now you can see that yeah, basically only the white areas uh, from this is actually going to be uh, making the changes that are right here. So really simple to do, right? Um, now, having done this a lot, uh, it does get pretty complicated very quickly, adding in lots and lots of textures and all different masks and things. So I've put it all into one convenient node, which you've probably already downloaded. It's called the Polygon Color Variation Node. And it's of course in the blend file below. So this is what it looks like. And it's basically got the settings that I find most useful for this kind of thing. Um, so the scale of it, pretty simple. You can see that it's got a, it's just basically like as a default, so if you can hear any noise out there, hey, it's isolation, isn't uh, quarantine fun? I'm working from home now. Um, but uh, we've got this uh, scale value here, which uh, you can see it's like, it's got kind of like a color uh, variation effect. So this is the default like hue change, um, which you can see already does quite a lot to, yeah, just break it up and kind of add in little hues and just, uh, yeah, it's a very subtle effect, but it does a lot. And then you've got a dark spot and bright spot underneath it, and they're controlled by this threshold value here. Um, so you can see if you just want like some really uh, big ones, turn the scale down, something like this. Um, you could add like dark spots, um, maybe no bright spots, etc. So I tried to make it as like artist friendly as possible. Um, and then you got seed value, of course, if you wanna change that. Um, so what I generally do is I add in like one for like the big large scale shapes and then I duplicate it. And this one becomes the small scale shapes, right? So I just increase the scale here and uh, yeah, sort of dark spots, sort of turn down the threshold. So I get like, just like almost like a flick, like a little splatter of a few little dark spots. Um, let's turn down the threshold like that. 
And if you want to see just the mask as well, you can look at just the mask view by control shift clicking on it and you can see the uh, the actual noise texture that's driving it. Um, but you can see, you know, I'm just sort of, I haven't got time to m mess with all the settings now, but you can see already it's it's done a lot to, to break it up from where it was uh, originally. Um, and that's just with the power of procedural nodes. So that's number two. Number three is to blend it with other materials. So just like how in the real world, nothing is uniform. Well, over a large enough surface, uh, no material is continuous, right? Um, if you go to a little known website called Google Maps and look at some satellite images, you'll see that uh, even sports fields, right? Aren't a continuous grass texture forever, right? It's mixed in with all sorts of little uh, mud and straw and straw, not straw, like dead grass and stuff like that, right? Like it's completely patchy. Um, I don't know if this is an Australian thing, but um, I'm actually surprised at how patchy our fields are <laughs> according to Google Maps. They don't look too good. Um, but anyways, so have a look at some reference photos or whatever you're making. If you're making Iceland, whatever, just go on Google Maps and have a look at what the ground looks like way out there. And you'll see that it's varied between stone and mud and grass and dead grass and all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so I went on Polygon and I found, uh, just a dirt texture. I think I used, it was this one, dirt 009. And you'll notice that it's not just a color map. Of course, it's got all these other maps here, which we are going to use. So um, you could, of course, you know, go in here and uh, add in, uh, you know, texture, image texture, one by one. That's really, really repetitive and annoying. So we've got an add-on that just does it for you. So it's called the Polygon Material Converter. How many times can I mention Polygon in one video? Um, but it's one of our materials, so it works in it, right? So um, once you've, uh, you, you find the folder where you unzip all your other textures to, and then it will just find it if you just hit reload, it's right there. And then you'll see a load and apply button, um, which will apply it to your material. So if you just had it selected, it would do like that. And then you would find like this, um, one node group here with everything inside it, color, gloss, all that kind of thing. And it's all set up for you. Now, I don't want it to overwrite my material. So I'm gonna go back to the material that I had before, which is this guy with all our fanciness to it. And what I can do now is just go shift a group and we'll actually see our material there as a group, which is very handy. So move that out the way. And uh, you can see if we look through it, it's got, you know, the roughness map, the normal map, all that kind of thing. Right. So, right. So this, this grass short here, this has got its own four maps uh, and this has got its own four maps as well. Now it's very easy, of course, to, you know, add in a noise texture and blend between them with a mix node. Um, however, you've got all these four maps with it, right? So that would be a challenge to set that up for all of these maps and blend between them. So... <laughs> another node. How many nodes? Uh, one more node. <laughs> so it's called the Polygon PBR Mixer node. And it's branded as Polygon, but I promise you this and this and this works with any textures that you have uh, on your drive. I don't want this to sound like it's a big advertisement. I'm just giving it to you. It's called the Polygon PBR Mixer node, but basically it just blends between two sets of um, texture maps, right? So you've got the, the roughness, you've got the normal map, and you've got the displacement map for material one. And then you've got the exact same one for material two. So you just connect them like so. Um, and then once you've done that, they are in one little material like this, then you have a factor amount there at the top that blends between them like so. Very, very handy, which means, oh, and by the way, of course, this UV, you wanna make sure you're using the same UVs um, as your Polygon Uber mapping node. Um, if the scale was different, obviously you just duplicate it and make a different scale, but anyways, it's fine. Um, so now that we've done that, uh, as we go from zero to one, we are switching between uh, the grass and the dirt texture, which means finally, of course, when we add in a noise texture here, this plugged into the factor input now becomes a blend between the two of them. So what I like to do is, uh, I like to use 4D, by the way. Um, 4D, if you're just wondering what that does, the W, it just acts as a seed value. Um, so if you have 3D, you're kind of fixed. 
Um, but then 40, you get this little thing, which is a seed value. Mm, there you go. Um, anyways, uh, that, that acts as that. So what I like to do is I run this through a map range mode node, which is similar to the color ramp node. If you're wondering what on earth I'm doing here, um, except this is, it gives you a little bit more control on the color ramp. Um, it's like, it's based on value ranges and it's a little bit better. Essentially what I want to do is I just want to cut off the uh, the lowest range and that's going to become the dirt. So the white areas are going to become my grass and the black areas are going to become my dirt. And the other thing I like to do is blend two noise textures together and blend them with a overlay node, mix overlay node like so. And then I set that as that. And then this, I use like a higher value. Um, and what I'm trying to replicate here is a uh, like the patches of grass. So looking at grass, patchy if i just pull this up um reference is key guys reference is key don't just go throwing in nodes but like actually look online and you'll find your work looks immediately better i just want to make it look like it looks like someone has like flicked like paint off a brush and that's become like the dirt patches right so that's what i'm trying to emulate here with this um you can see i now have sort of control over the contrast of it I mean, this, what I'm doing with the map range node, I get it, it's probably confusing. This smoother step, it's kind of a contrasty thing. It probably deserves its own tutorial, but really, you know, you could probably find tutorials on the map range node, but essentially it's just like contrasting it. And of course, uh, since we went to the trouble of using all those maps, we of course now have to plug this into our principled BSDF, which is simple, it's just, it's like playing connect the dots with kids, right? Uh, roughness to roughness, the blue goes to the blue, the displacement. The displacement goes into the displacement input if you're using it, but we're not. Um, but look at that, ha 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 ha. Oh, are we using it? Yes, we're looking at the principles. Um, so there you go, right? Um, you've also got like little controls if you wanna like make the dirt like a higher roughness, right? If there was like, uh, where's the sunlight coming from? It's coming from that direction. So you'd see like a faint little amount of reflection off of the grass and then like the dirt would be a little harder in appearance. And of course, um, a really key thing if you find like yours just looks awful is to make sure that your materials um, blend, now, like they have the same values. Like I typically find like that's usually like a big key factor in why something doesn't look right. Um, so yeah, you know, you can change the hue or whatever or the saturation just depending on what, what two different random textures you're dealing with, which whichever you pulled off of line, they're online, they're probably not gonna work together out of the box, right? Um, but uh, yeah, anyways, you, you can fix it like that. Um, but there you go, you can see this obviously, obviously looks far less uh, repetitive, right? Because of course we're using a whole separate new material with it. Um, little trick, by the way, I use dirt here to make the dirt patches, but you can also do the exact same thing by just taking a material which is similar to your existing one. So if you got one grass texture and then you blend it with another grass texture, um, that's a very way, like a, a good way of keeping the same, you know, the same material. Um, but of course using this same effect, it's gonna look far less repetitive. It's almost gonna look like the same material. Um, but anyways, that's it. That is uh, blending another material. That's method number three. The fourth and final technique is height variation, adding waviness to your actual surface uh, to displace the actual geometry of it, I mean. Um, that sounds painfully obvious, but it's very easy to overlook and it actually adds a lot to the believability of your surface. Um, so, you know, the easiest method of course would be to, you know, just add in like a subsurf modifier and then a displacement modifier and then just kind of make random waviness. I actually like to use the displacement from the node group here because then you can actually infuse it, whoops, infuse it with some of these nodes here and it'll look, it'll look mint, trust me. Well, now I gotta live up to that. But anyways, this is the way I do it. So first of all, this plane is a plane. There is nothing else to it other than four vertices, which is good because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a subsurf modifier, change it to simple so that it doesn't round out those edges there. Um, and then I wanna use uh, adaptive displacement, adaptive subdivision, <laughs> so that uh, parts that are closer to the camera have more geometry added, which is what you want, because otherwise you end up using all the memory in the world and you won't get as close to a realistic result as this. Anyways. I got a whole video on that if you want to look up micro displacements. But anyways, essentially all you need to do is uh, change your feature set to experimental. And then when you do that, you'll see this adaptive checkbox in the subsurf modifier there. 
Um, so once you've done that, uh, now you'll have enough geometry to actually start physically displacing the surface there. So then you add in a displacement modifier here, set this uh, into the vector, uh, sorry, the displacement input, vector displacement. It's just a displacement input. And then whatever you put into this height input here, that is gonna drive the actual waviness of this. So if I took a standard noise texture like this and just drop that in there, we might not see much happening. Uh, but if we increase the scale, oh, that's right. Okay, one more step as well is underneath your material settings, you gotta make sure you change it from displacement bump only to displacement and bump. And then when you do that, you should see if we increase the scale, there we go. We're actually seeing it physically displace it. And look what, like you can see like that adds something to it, right? Like it's got, it's got, it's got a little something, something. It looks like wavy surface, right? It's a, uh, it's very, very, very hard. Even a soccer field, a golf course. Speak to any golf course owner. I'll t I'm sure they'll tell you how hard it is to keep something flat. The world is just naturally wavy, man. And uh, you got you to gotta try and replicate that. So the other thing that we can do now that we're using nodes here instead of just doing a displacement modifier is um, we can take this. So this uh, pattern here where like these parts are like the dirt parts. So dirt would be lower than grass. So if I can make that dig into the surface, then that would, uh, that would help me out. So I wanna essentially take the black and white mask of that and mix it with the black and white mask of this. So if I just did that with a mix RGB node, take the output of this, put that, let's say into the bottom input. I'm just, I'm guessing it. I think I've gotta do something else. Uh, all right, let's just have a look at this, okay. That is good. It's going the wrong way though. Uh, so instead I want to add an invert node in here like that. And now it should actually be digging into it. Now, um, the height, the, the scale that we had this to is actually correct as to what we want, but it's just that this extra map here is driving this too, too much. So instead I just want to drop this factor screen value down like so. Um, until the, these little divots here actually look good. So that, that way I have my big wavy shapes which is you know, driven by, by this here, right? Um, but then I also have my smaller little wavy shapes um, that is just, and I can control that with just this screen value here. So it's two separate settings. This one controls the smaller details. This one controls all of the details. Um, and, and that's basically that, right? So it, it's a small little thing, as I said, but it's very easy to overlook. You finish a scene and you go, something's not right. And then you go, oh yeah, the plane is a plane and that doesn't exist in the real world. Um, yeah, so you gotta, you gotta add in some randomness. Um, the same methods, of course, as I mentioned here, can be used uh, just essentially, since this is all essentially procedural, if you just like scale up this plane um, and then you know change the, the scaling of your noise texture, change the scaling of your UV map, um, then you essentially just get more and more and more landscape. It's a really fun method. So hope you enjoyed this guys. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends so that others can find it and you'll be supporting this channel as well. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.